Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to day two of our 15th annual first virtual Secure 360. So today we have Bridger McGaugh and Brian Strasser there to talk to us. Um, you can poll us with questions, and Andy and I are on the call, and we'll forward these questions on to the presenters. So with that, I turn it over to you, Bridger and Brian. All right, uh, good morning, everyone. Brian Strauser here. Uh, happy to be presenting to all of you today at our first virtual Secure 360. And pleased to have my friend and colleague, Bridger McGaw, with us from uh, Lexington, Massachusetts today, uh, speaking on behalf of Athena Health. The way that we're going to uh, kind of approach this presentation, um, I'm going to really kind of guide the discussion by asking Bridger some questions, and then we've prepared some slides that he'll walk through and I'll add some color commentary along the way. Um, we've left plenty of time for questions at the end. So, you know, be sending those in uh, for Val and Andy, our two moderators to see, and they'll we'll get to those um, during the Q&A segment at the end. What we're talking about today is um, what's on everyone's mind. How do you lead through a complex novel crisis? Uh, and we're gonna be really focused on the COVID-19 uh, crisis that we've all been through. Just briefly for introduction, um, I'm Brian Strauser. I'm principal and CEO at BrightPath, a consulting firm based here in Shoreview. We do work with Athena Health. So some of the things that you'll see today are a part of a collaboration between uh, Athena Health and our organization over the last several years. Uh, in addition to my role at BrightPath, uh, I'm a senior fellow at the Center for Cyber and Homeland Security at Auburn University, where my work has been around um, kind of the uh, preparation and coordination between public and private sector for large complex situations like the COVID-19 crisis. Bridger? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Bridger McGaugh. I'm the Director of Global Security and Services at Athena Health, uh, headquartered in Watertown, Massachusetts, just a stone throw um, from Boston. Uh, and uh, you may know Watertown from the, uh, it was the site of uh, the marathon um, bombing final shootout and capture of the marathon bombers um, where the incident command post was uh, on our campus. Uh, I've been at Athena Health for seven years. Um, prior to that, spent eight years at the Department of Homeland Security in various roles um, in cybersecurity, transportation security, mainly critical infrastructure and public-private partnerships. Um, and before that worked in, as a press secretary for the White House and the Defense Department. I'm really excited to speak with you today. Thanks, Bridger. So let, let's start with the basics because um, you know most of the attendees here are, are not from uh, the East Coast and may not be familiar with your company. Can you kind of describe to us, tell us about Athena Health, uh, maybe a little bit about your culture, and then talk to us about your, your business continuity and crisis management programs. Sure, happy to. Um, Let's go to the next slide. So um, Athena Health is a cloud-based health IT company. Um, we're 20, uh, 23 years old, founded by um, Todd Park and Jonathan Bush back in 1997, actually in an effort to improve women's health. Um, they started a health clinic. Um, this uh, grew into um, what it is today, which is a electronic medical records um, provider, a patient portal, as well as uh, a revenue cycle um, and claims processing um, company. The, the goal there, um, and we've, we've been a public, we've been privately held, we went public, and now we're privately held again. Um, but our mission has remained the same, is to really be a partner with um, the healthcare provider um, to drive better outcomes. And our vision is to create an ecosystem that del delivers accessible, high quality and sustainable healthcare for all, and really try to improve the overall quality and access to healthcare across the country. We're just in, uh, operating in the United States. Next slide. Um, I think uh, what's important is, so we serve um, our clients, our healthcare providers, over 160,000, um, but those, um, healthcare providers serve over 40% of the population. So um, having worked in critical infrastructure, um, Athena Health is providing electronic medical records and claims processing service that is supporting claims coming in from 40% of the US population. So uh, we have three different um, services. We also merged with um, a legacy GE Health um, product that uh, came into our, so we have over, 
um, uh, was it 10,000 um, specific, Oops. is that right? 10,000, yeah. Um, no, 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 we took that out. But uh, clients that are using these different platforms to serve all of these providers, Hippocrates is the mobile platform, I, and many of you can just download it for free from the App Store, but this is a clinical decision support tool that's basically used by one in three doctors in the care setting. So um, with uh, some of the innovations that we'll share, um, we're able to very rapidly engage with healthcare providers. We're now over a $1.7 billion revenue company. Um, next slide. But we're all of this is to drive the improvement in their performance. Um, and to do it, we're still a relatively, you know, a, a small company. I'm still amazed at um, that how much, um, how wide and and how many different parts of the country that we're operating in. But it's we're only about 53, 5,400 employees these days. We're in six U.S. cities, Seattle, Austin, Atlanta, um, Burlington, Vermont. Watertown, Mass, and Belfast, Maine, and then um, four cities in India and three different um, states there. But the majority, and then we have a sizable employee population that's actually remote. So as I talk through all the our efforts on our preparedness response um, and resilience programs, they have to meet so many different risk environments um, that that I'm amazed I can keep them all straight in my head. Um, and they cover uh, all the different cycles uh, seasonally, so uh, around the world. So that's another challenge. Next slide. So Athena, um, we're a pretty young company. We're, I think our average age still is hovering in the 30 to 33 range. Uh, we're an R&D company. So, you know, we have a, I guess, typical IT, um, flavor until we all went to our work from home environments. Um, you know, we have dogs in the office. Uh, we're very dynamic, you know, we lots of um, collaborative, agile, dense space, uh, uh, open floor plans. Um, but in offices that are very non-traditional, we rescued a lot of old um, historic buildings and, and recreated them. We live in a renovated um, 200 plus year old now, uh, Ex Army base that was part of um, the BRAC program and an ex Superfund site and a former power plant in Texas um, and a hundred year old building in Seattle. So we're really trying to, um, we like that sort of give new energy and innovation to things that are old. Um, and we try to do that with uh, a lot of fun uh, in the mix, which uh, is now remote fun. <laughs> What else can I tell you? Let's go to the next slide. So let's talk about our program. So um, I think that uh, we could have a uh, month long, maybe year long debate about this slide and what it, how we define resilience as a um, at many levels, locally, um, as, as, a, as a state, as a nation state, as a global citizen. Um, we recognize that some companies, depending on their size, may have appointed global, um, you know, chief resilience officers, or maybe your chief security officer is now a chief resilience officer, um, in an effort to, you know, push some things underneath uh, organizationally. Uh, other entities have made resilience into an energy sustainable and climate um, uh, focus uh, in the in the effort to reduce energy. Um, or promote energy independence and alternatives, which is great. Um, so, but at Athena, um, uh, after my time in, in Homeland Security and all of those debates, um, we've settled on uh, ensuring that Athena Health is prepared to rapidly respond and recover from an unacceptable consequence. Uh, and specifically, um, and I'm going to sort of this will be a theme throughout this is the focus is also is stays on our patients and providers um, really tying the program to the business um, the undercurrent there is uh, employees are always part of that of any life safety program but what we were trying to do with the resilience um, focus was really remind employees that they have a role to play um, in ensuring that our platform our cloud-based um, IT platform that's serving providers and their patients is always available to them 
regardless of what's going on in the universe and uh and and staying in touch with that all hazards mission um as such it's played out we've had typhoons and droughts and hurricanes um the marathon bombing um you know the tornadoes um wildfires an active volcano um in manila not in new, you know new jersey or somewhere closer <laughs> but um when <laughs> i'll just share i did get some flack for putting a volcano in this graphic um from our um very humorous employee base um and then we actually had this uh, the vault the tall volcano erupt in um the philippines and we have partners operating along with some expat employees in manila and so um now no one makes fun of the fact that i have a volcano preparedness plan um <laughs> next slide but the 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 goal um with our resilience program and and with any um security program was we had to start small i mean i've been i've now been at athena for seven years but and six of those strictly focused on um security and 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 resilience but i had to start with what i had and what i had was a commitment by the company that we should have a good physical security program not the best physical security program but a good one and a good one involves all the standard um life safety plans workplace violence you know natural disasters mainly blizzards because at the time in 2014 we were only in belfast and watertown um and we had visions and we're in the um expansion plans for atlanta austin um and and uh san francisco we're now out of that um city but at the time uh we were just focused on um insider threats criminal activity standard physical security concerns um with some information technology tie-ins right uh so the the st the things we would use were guards visitor management systems um and uh you know dual factor authentication on our badges good partnerships with our local police departments um standard um physical security programs but it formed a layered security story and so what i tried to do is start with in order for me to get us from a nascent program in two sites to this much more bigger vision um, expansion in india expansion in the us um, was to start with what we what they accepted and just try to um, turn it into a framework that it made logical sense where all the pieces would fit together so here you see a physical and network um, perimeter these are two words that two cultures understand there's a network perimeter Oh, physical perimeter. Oh, yeah, we work together at the perimeter. Um, and so as I started building a story, can it next? Um, it became much easier to start telling a story of what about if we all did other things together, like integrate all the business continuity planning and programming, which we're doing, but so that it naturally reinforces both the platform security um, for our electronic medical record and all our services and our information technology security program and our physical security program since we're all working together by the time um this uh concept had come uh, into play it was naturally accepted because we'd been i've been showing them how the story fit together aren't you concerned about that yes i'm concerned about that problem too well why don't we work on it together so the way in which you um I found a way to unite these three disparate teams, cybersecurity, platform security, and physical security is through internal audit. I know, you weren't thinking I was gonna say internal audit. Um, I knew that our internal auditors controlled all the controls across all of these different um, lines of business. And I made it my mission to just stick close to what compliance and the internal audit was trying to accomplish. Because if I could focus on patients and providers in terms of improving their um, ability, ability for our services to bounce back, and control saw that each of the things that I wanted to do would improve our compliance and our ability to deliver on the services, thus improving controls, maybe I could generate some momentum um, from an unlikely ally. Um, which proved to be the case. Um, 
So as a result, I guess, you know, I think what is important to our Athena Resilience Program is everyone now believes that they have a role to play in the success, you know, this is six years later, um, but in an effort to, uh, on our physical, our cyber, and our platform, to agree on what are the most important risks that we should tackle, and how do we know that we've arrived at one of those, i.e., um, we have a, uh, I guess if you think about war games, um, DEF CON 1 versus DEF CON 5. Culturally, I had two business units that thought a 5 was really bad, and the other one thought a 1 was really bad. Um, that that's You can't have that in incident management and in, in crisis management. And since I managed all of the crisis management, I had to get both of them to align their concerns so that as we declared different levels of concern, we would agree that we're all working on the same level of concern. Once mm -hmm. we realign that story, it's much easier to move towards resilience. Next slide. So here, so this was the framework that we sort of embraced. Um, and uh, Brian and I have a constant sort of <laughs> laugh about the slide because depending on who you're talking to you you um, <laughs> you amend how you're going to use this slide so this is not a flow chart this is not a decision tree this is not where we derive our authorities from um but, but it could be all of those things depending on what what we needed to do uh but what we try to do in this slide as we began intro reintroducing athena to a much more robust way of thinking about their new um, role in the country's healthcare system was to understand that the incident command system was a proven doctrine that works. It was um, going to afford us opportunities in the future to better support our clients, especially in larger health systems, especially um, as they face and interact with local law enforcement, emergency response in hurricane, um, especially in hurricane prone areas. And as we saw more um, communication between our clients and Athena in terms of who's your incident commander, and then people were like, I don't know, what's an incident commander? Um, it became much easier for me as the incident commander to say, they're talking about the crisis management team. Oh, well, we should, now we understand why, Bridger, you're trying to um, use these languages that are acceptable to the clients, not necessarily to a high tech company, but to our clients and our providers and our partners, and just educate the workforce that's going to collaborate with them in time, times of crisis. So as you look at this diagram, you can see that regardless of the incident that we're going to, the unintended consequence that we're trying to prepare for, we have... Um, put building blocks in place and named those business units even as they are flexible. So the crisis communications team is not just crisis communicators. It's made up of subject matter experts across disciplines in physical, cyber, and um, product security uh, so that there's an expertise embedded and there's trust and partnership built. Facilities, we deal with it all the time, life safety, EMS response, you know, um, trip and falls, slip and falls, all those types of things. However, um, they could rapidly escalate based on the scope, scale, and severity of the incident. Insert conversation about a volcano here, right? So um, the CMT activation decision could be, could never happen because we can manage all of these people based on, um, on our ability to actually manage these incidents lower um, through a, a much more bifurcated plan. What you'll see up top is um, we've also presupposed that the executives get comfortable with the fact that my role as an incident commander means that I will potentially acquire more staff if I need them. And that's why it's on the diagram. But that's our, this is sort of our one way of uh, educating executives that there's a very um, aggressive um, and broad sweeping um, team at the company, even if my own team is very small, there's an expectation that everyone's all in on response. Okay, so with that as background, Bridger, take us back to 
January as you know you got your first indication that coronavirus or co- what became known as COVID-19 was going to be a challenge. This is back when I yeah. think they were just the first cases here in the U.S. And kind of walk us through what that initial stage looked like. Sure. Um, so we were we were monitoring um, the volcano in in Manila, and our um, we started seeing a lot more coverage of of a coronavirus in China. Um, and and it, <laughs> I, I it, full disclosure, uh, in my previous job in 2009, I was. I was working on the pandemic, on the H1N1 pandemic, and um, I'm not, uh, I guess I'm sensitized to the fact that these things do not happen the way you expect them to happen. And the bird flu plans didn't apply to the H1N1 plans. And then um, the talk about the coronavirus just kept sticking with me as something that just didn't feel right. Um, We began monitoring that. outbreak we had people in asia um but we also have a large presence in india and so uh and we had this small um uh one or two cases starting to show up in the us so we began actively monitoring it uh this resulted i have a global security operations center i can happy to tell you how to if you don't have one how to build one um very cheaply and convince everyone to give you more money later um but uh the gsoc became critical to pub um publishing awareness raising reports over the course of february so um that allowed us we to start communicating that people should be paying attention to what's going on that this didn't feel right that we would start seeing issues Um, And just the act of communicating outward that I was monitoring this resulted in our product team communicating with me that they too are seeing this and they're beginning efforts to modify our product in response. Um, And this is, you know, this is before we've even declared it uh, a pandemic. Um, So uh, that became really important. I also had already become a partner with, um, as a member of the health sector, coordinating council. And so I was getting updates from um, the assistant secretary for preparedness and response at the Department of Health and Human Services um, to make sure that I was getting uh, information from them. And those regular updates helped validate inside the company that what they were hearing from medical providers, they were hearing from HHS. um, And this allowed us to to build um, a lot more attention within the company. So by the end of February, I had met with our human capital officer and our crisis communicators, um, prepared an internal communications um, that went out both uh, jointly from the human uh, chief human capital officer and myself to the employees, telling them that we were monitoring this, that they needed to um, you know, read these communications. Um, and that sort of sensitized the entire corporation that the company was not ignoring it and that we were making plans. Um, I think, Brian, the biggest challenge for us right there was we had had our um, plans drafted, um, you know, for business continuity purposes, uh, but needed to tell everyone that this is the time where they needed to turn them on. And it's very Mm -hmm. rare that we had to turn all of them on simultaneously. Usually it was just operations in Maine. And so um, we scheduled a call. I was actually oddly going to the DRI um, conference for business continuity practitioners in Georgia. And of course, there was a lot of questions about should I go travel, blah, blah, blah. Um, But low risk. So I traveled. And there, the CDC is Lisa Kuhn, Dr. Lisa Kunin, who I knew from the pan H1N1. She actually said, you need to plan for 30 to 40 percent absenteeism and when a expert practitioner in the field for 30 years tells you here's your planning assumption there's no the debate's over the planning assumption's been given and action and and i immediately moved with brian we got all of our um, planners together that had imminent needs and gave them the planning assumption and said this is your priority right now use this this time um, mm-hmm. 
do you, should I just keep going? Yeah. I just see. Okay. So um, I think what's important as we look at this um, moment, so this is the first week of March and um, the way in which we've been um, thinking about it. So we've been monitoring the issues. I've talked to our business continuity plan owners and they manage our largest, um, some of them, our tech enabled services and our customer care, they have the biggest set of people driven processes. So a lot of human capital working to um, ensure that a, a number of processes take place. And those people are spread out across um, the US, India and in, in Manila, um, both in our third trusted third party vendors um, and our own employees. And the challenge with that is all of our planning scenarios, everyone's planning scenario in the whole world doesn't account for a simultaneous um, attack on all operating environments. There's some, there should be some way to shift work from one site to another. Um, you know, you can roll out your hot site or your operationalize a cold site, um, but not when it hits every single site um, within weeks. And considering the speed that we were seeing um, overseas with the spread, uh, this, you know, and Lisa Kunin's warning um, to all of our planners, we took advantage of that to really start focusing on how do we move all of our operations to work from home? How do we get all of this to remote work? Um, and uh while still again you know I'll, it's true that no security person can ever really go on vacation um no business continuity person can really go on vacation uh i kept my my fi on the whole time i was at this conference vpn into my network trying to um keep abreast of what was going on and at the same time realize the um the crisis management team was going to need to be activated we were going to need to begin operations um and so while uh while at the conference um we initiated our um crisis management team we stood up um a call with the executives and we began planning uh, uh to implement not only all of our business continuity plans um and their work from home strategies but starting to drill into like what are the most urgent um, matters that we needed to address. Um, so here are some of the initial actions that we took. And uh, the first one, you know, I was on essential travel. We, um, I, I think it's interesting, but we halted all further non-essential business travel. So um, for anyone who was traveling, uh, we had them finish up what they were doing and come home. We initiated a full stop using our travel agency to make sure that no trips were um, booked through any of the hotspot countries. You couldn't transit them. Um, so when uh, we, we had a number of employees overseas, we had to figure out how to get them home. Uh, and there were still a number of conferences that we had people traveling to uh, in Florida, um, Las Vegas, uh, and we had people flying in from around the world. And we had to make decisions um, to both stop the international travel, even though we there wasn't a lot of uh, support for that right now from governments or other companies. But um, once some of the larger Facebook, Google started um, rumblings that they were going to cancel things or pull back sponsorships um, and not send their people, it really allowed smaller companies like Athena to really move aggressively to curtail exec, um, any of our non-essential travel um, and start um, uh, dialing back our meetings to much smaller numbers. The um, business continuity plan activation and the planning guidance, I can't stress that enough. This really allowed teams that we'd exercised to review their plans, modify and identify areas where you know, we don't have work from, you know, we don't have monitors um, for uh, developers at home. We're going to need those. So we were able to assess how much equipment we would need within the first, you know, week of March. Um, and by the time we or ordered work from home a week later in all sites, 
we didn't have an equipment shortage. We had ordered the you know uh, wireless uh, MiFi devices that we'd need. We uh, we we knew where all the laptop uh, extra laptops were that we uh, might need, um, and we had sort of um, positioned that equipment appropriately. Uh, HR since they'd been uh, part of this conversation much earlier had already begun working on addressing our hourly employees sick leave compensation and um, you know the hazard pay in terms of like what are we going to do with the employees like facilities and security that need to stay on site um, how are we going to handle that um, and so we began those conversations um, the I guess the warning I would issue in any planning is that there's always the the things you control and the things you don't control. I don't control the landlord's behavior. Um, and so in, in Seattle, uh, there was a non, there was a, since testing doesn't exist, there was someone who thought they may have been exposed to someone who may have been exposed to someone who knew Ferris. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was such a chain of awkward um, explanations that an entire building in Seattle shut down. And then that situation happened in, in our building, which was just down the street. But the mere act of another building that is miles from our site and our employees seeing that that building closed due to this assumption that someone had, may have, could have, didn't actually. Um, come in contact with anyone with COVID, but still closed it and everybody went home, resulted in a lot of our employees being nervous and scared. And so out of an abundance of caution, we sent everybody home. And then very shortly, the stay-at-home orders in Seattle started to kick in. And then the um, this basically causes all the other sites to say, well, if you're doing that in Seattle, what about us? And so it very quickly, um, we took it, you know, used that experience in Seattle, applied what we learned hearing from our employees, and then the executives very quickly um, implemented work from home. And because it was always the strategy for our business continuity plans, it wasn't um, that painful. It was just fast. Really fast. <laughs> really fast. So there were a couple, uh, there were kind of two big, two big decisions we talked about uh leading at this kind of time frame that really kept things moving for you. So can you tell us a little bit about those? Um, sure. So uh, <laughs> we wanted to make sure that uh, we identified a couple functions that needed to stay. They have specialized equipment in a specialized facility um, that only exists in one place. And we knew that uh, we had to harden up on this site. Uh, the good news was uh, the building itself uh, was an old bank data center and um, hardened uh, in the early uh, 2000s against everything you could think of. So it had two weeks of independent supplies. It could operate off the grid um, for about a month. And uh, we knew that we could take care of it, but we had to convince how do we get the staff to stay? How do we make sure they're safe? This isn't about a kinetic event from outside. This is something that um, they could get sick and bring it to the office. How do we really focus on that knowing there isn't any testing? Um, and so this is where internal communications and your partnership with communications and your um, business leaders. So we brought all the employees together. We told them everything we knew about COVID-19. We told them why their work was important. We explained our HR policy changes and the um, improvements in, and the uh, pay changes that we were making. But then we also implemented all of the guidelines that we had from the CDC. So we went to swing shifts. We spread the work out. We spread the people out. We gave them the PPE that we could. So um, in this case, people didn't need masks because they're physically separated from each other. And that wasn't the guidance at the time. Um, but some people wanted to use gloves because they were handling a lot of mail um, and processing mail. And so they wanted to use gloves. And most people remember the anthrax um, issues in 2001. And so, uh, and we were still processing mail back then. And that's what they did. So 
the team itself had a historical knowledge that, uh, you know, how to get through these um, issues and culturally um, had known each other for a long time. And by really getting the people together, explaining them the problem, um, that rallying um, them to this mission and that this is what helps our clients and ties them, you know, to that, that whole uh, workflow uh, really gave them the mission um, focus they needed. We gave them the PPE they needed. We social distanced them. Um, we also, I manage catering um, and coffee bars for Athena. Uh, it's one of my favorite um, things to do as a security person is to pull a good shot of espresso. Um, not very good at it, but I try. Uh, but we had a dedicated catering team. And so I could control that knowing that all the food that they were going to be served while working in this facility was going to be to a standard um, of cleanliness and, and preparation that was going to keep them healthy um, and uh, safe on that front. And then we locked the whole building down. Unless you were the 56 people that have access to that building, no one goes in or out. So um, all other personnel were um, locked out of the building. And that really helped us, um, I think, give those people the, the, the confidence that the company was behind them. On the BPO side, between InfoSec and our information security teams, our product teams, um, our legal and compliance teams, they worked um, over, like an exorbitant amount of time with our BPO partners to move very quickly before India locked down all of its sites um, to really figure out how to get additional equipment from um, offices and placed in homes and then all of the information security protocols um, put in place on new devices so that the BPO volumes could still be handled, but in a, um, a, a non-site uh, in these work from home environments. Um, if we hadn't made those moves in the in the first week of, and uh, uh, second week of March, we would have missed the window. And in, I can tell you um, in India, when they lock something down, it's, 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 it's immediate. It's no joke. Like, it's no <laughs> joke. In, like in the movies, the, the barricades come out, um, and, and the thing gets locked down. This isn't in, in the United States where we talk about it and, you know, it looks nice and you can't tell. Um, it's, this is, this was much different. So um, that partnership again um, in establishing the, the level of urgency and then communicating um, the opportunity and the innovation that, that leaders had made that all happen. But if we hadn't moved fast um, and we had really debated it for a long time, it wouldn't have worked. So Bridger, you know, as you showed your crisis management framework, um, you know, you've got a crisis management team and an executive leadership team. Um, can you talk a little bit about kind of what your battle rhythm looked like in terms of meetings and maybe a little bit of insight yeah. into what those conversations look like? So um, we ran, I learned early on that uh, how your executive team um, wants to be man uh, wants to participate in an emergency is really going to drive the tempo. Uh, this CEO wanted to do daily calls and made that very clear from the first meeting. Um, you know, we should meet daily. And okay, I guess our battle rhythm is going to be daily. Um, however, uh, I don't know. No one knows how fast this is going to change. Are we going to have new information? What's it going to look like? Um, and what are all these people, you know, those eight, 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 10 executives, what are they going to talk about on every call? Uh, the most important thing that I knew was I needed to have them unified around what we were doing. What were our critical path items that we were going to take? So when you look at this map, the executive leadership teams reporting to our private equity and also managing down into our organization. And so I had them set priorities right out of the gate. What was the commander's intent? Um, and commander's intent is not the battle rhythm for the meeting. It's what are our priorities? And we set three priorities right out of the gate. Protect the people, protect our employees, and their and their our office's ability to provide functions for our clients, right? So th that first, um, that was our prime directive. The second one was ensure that um, tech-enabled services can continue um, to deliver on our claims processing and our revenue generating. Um, I guess that was it. And, and the third one was our customer care obligations. Make sure that our customers can actually engage with the company effectively. So our client support center, our call center, um, 
and our portal case management that all the employees that are involved in that work doesn't stop. There can't be any, you can't get a busy signal. We, our doctors need to be able to reach Athena Health. Um, and that allowed us to move very quickly on all of those issues I just talked about. But if we hadn't set our commander's intent, um, it's, it's much harder because um, everyone has their own parochial issues. Um, as a result, uh, we kept things um, focused. Next, um, everything is about communications. It's all about communications. So our partnership, um, so we focused on um, internal communications, client communications, and external communications. And we set up, we made sure that each of those three areas was gonna form, um, was gonna brief daily because those are the three primary channels of reaching into um, our, our stakeholder groups. Um, and what that uh, allowed us to do is not only set up what the agenda was for a full meeting, um, but gave each of the executives um, action items. So if you're working with clients, you funnel, you know, we're going to talk about uh, client communication. So that's what, you know, you're going to report to that person. So each of the executives had a action officer um, sort of working with their issues. Uh, we then are on our crisis management team, which is all the business continuity functions. We set that up to be Monday, Wednesday, Friday to reinforce each of the EL, uh, the executive leadership calls. The crisis communications calls, we slotted as daily as well, so that the comms would start in the morning, use the media cycle to drive the crisis management team calls, which would drive the executive leadership calls, and then we would repeat. And then um, it, we did about five weeks of that tempo before we modified it. All right. One of the things that stood out that you mentioned earlier is there were a number of partnerships that you have in place that helped yeah. gave you a gave you early insight, but also you know kind of gave you a two way connection to get other information. Can you talk a little bit about what that looks like? Yeah, I won't. I won't. I'll say two things about this. This is a lot of acronyms, um, but this is for the most part free. Um, and I worked in public private partnership. Um, when I was at Homeland Security working with a lot of these um, with businesses trying to improve resilience. But all of this, all of these efforts have substantially matured in the last 10 years. These, these are all free services that you as business security experts can all access. You can get on the sector coordinating councils. You can get sign up for all these listservs. You can participate in the National Business Emergency Operations Center that FEMA has. Um, I, I get feeds. The hardest part from all of these organizations um, is actually just reading the information, which mm -hmm. is why with a small team, you need a lot of writers and people that can read and analyze and then write um, some sort of compendium of all this information that they're getting, especially when you get into a, a crisis. Day-to-day -day operations, you can delete stuff because it doesn't pertain to you. But generally speaking, um, other than the Health ISAC, which we joined, um, which is a paid membership for collaboration, mainly on cyber, but also physical security, the rest of these organizations pump out free information about crisis management. And if I was to say there's one partnership that you should have, it's with your state emergency management agency. And if your state management emergency management agency is running a poor business emergency operations function, whether it be ESF 14 or whatever they're going to call it, um, you need to make it your mission to change that because they need you more than you um, need them in some cases. But mm -hmm. they want to be the right partner. They just might not be very good at this. So um, it takes people a long, it, it may take them a while or they might have the wrong person in the role, but don't get frustrated, but focus all your political energy on building up your state emergency management coordination with the private sector. That should be always the focus. So one of the things that's unique about Athena Health is that you're, you're not just managing the response for your you know, organization to maintain continuity of operations, but you're providing valuable critical tools in some cases to healthcare providers and surge capacity hospitals and others. Yep. That's not like a lot of folks that are on this call. So can you talk a little bit about what your communications and, and product teams did? 
Sure. Um, so I mentioned that uh, I think that one of the most important things you can do as a security person is know the business. Um, it's it's you may not have time for it, but when times of calm, you should go learn their names and what they're working on. I got myself inserted into a product development team. Um, so I was I was kept apprised of all this great stuff. They were able to get um, very rapidly into our production workflow. Since we're a cloud-based system, we could update all the client workflows overnight to make sure that COVID symptoms, checkers, um, and other um, specifics around COVID were um, always available um, to the provider networks, um, which resulted in increased screening. Now, again, there's no testing. So all we could do is help our providers screen for this um, in the hopes that they could then request a test from the CDC. Um, but again, we were putting all that information in the hands of 160,000 doctors um, within days of, of, of cases in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, next slide. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, if you go to Hippocrates, like the uh, CDC just modified the symptoms um, just last week. Uh, now, if you go to the Hippocrates app and click on the symptoms checker, all that stuff's right in there. So um, it constantly puts um, the most recent information in the hands of our providers. Um, the remember how I mentioned communications? You need to be a trusted partner with your press office and not just for like press releases, but for this kind of stuff. So um, we were able to really um, shape the message um, for our employees to help them. You know, we don't want to market our services. We do sell services to healthcare, but our, 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 we're on the front lines. We need to make sure that our employees understand that our frontline heroes, the healthcare providers are being supported by you, the person who needs to maybe work longer, harder, you know, from your house. Um, and so we put together um, internal communications and external resource hubs to really take all of the content and um, efforts that we have underway, make sure employees know about them, and then make sure the clients know about them. And then all that's publicly accessible. So if you go to the next slide, we took the power of a cloud-based healthcare platform and showed everyone this is um, one of the first things we did was we were trying to where are at-risk populations um, in the United States that we can see based on their risk profiles in AthenaNet and then um, publish that data so that if you're a healthcare provider out in the United States worried about your patients, you could then track this with the outbreak of COVID-19 um, and see the the outbreak of the of the disease and the virus along with where your at risk populations were. Um, so uh, that that kind of uh, thinking is 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 really important. So I want to shift and and talk a little bit about the things that um, you've learned and and things that uh, Athena Health has learned. We have about twelve minutes left in the oh, total boy. presentation. We want to leave some time for Q and A. So if we could kind of rapidly go, go real, through these, I'll go real fast. I know the slides and recording will be available later. So here we go. So things we learned. Um, so I did one-on-one -on -one training with the executives. They knew my face. They knew my name. They knew when I showed up in their offices that this was going to be something important. Um, I don't wait. I never wasted their time, but they could not escape. Um, their one-on-one -on -one briefing with me. Um, again, this was something I had audit put in our compliance regimes and then utilize that as a way to ensure um, uh, buy-in, but also to build trust um, with me as their, as, uh, and we had an entire new executive leadership team between February of 2019 um, and, and July, or sorry, and November. So it wasn't, uh, it was hard to do. Um, you need a place that monitors. You need a global security operations center. It can be virtual. It doesn't need to be flashy. You need analysts. You need people to read what's going on. The world is too complex a place. Um, th there are people that can provide these services to you. Um, I use uh, 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 Allied Universals um, as my security provider, um, and they help help support my team. But uh, you need someone to do this, uh, and it needs to be in place. Partnerships, we talked about it. You need to have them in advance. We had them in advance. I didn't have to go beg to get on a listserv. Um, I just started reading. Um, it's, the, you know, remember that you should do this now. Um, and then, 
it, you can't pass out business cards at a crisis, right? You 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 got to meet everybody in the company now, and you have to get them to buy into the fact that their day job is this drive the business, and their um, additional duty as assigned when you assign it to them is going to be incident management. Um, and I made it, I would make a point if you haven't already to get yourself into the next all hands meeting for your marketing, sales, comms teams and get them to buy into your vision of resilience that'll help you long term. On the, um, we did all, so all that was before we even got to COVID. In this, you gotta move fast. Some of this stuff is gut, um, you know, but some of it is, you know, getting the laptops, the wi MiFi's, the, the supply chains for those things were, were going to go um, into trouble. Um, I'm glad we moved early. Our planning assumptions, all sites being hit simultaneously. So that that got um, that wasn't a planning assumption. So everything we had done was questioned on day one. But because we had um, smart people who had gone through exercises and understood that we had a new planning assumption, we just started working again. And we had a good partner um, in Brightpath to keep people focused on what really needed to get um, done. Um, re uh, reallocation. So work shifting doesn't really work in this kind of context um, and so we had to come up with new new ways to get the work done i think we, our productivity is doing great in this new um environment and we're really happy about that um, um but it's it, it wasn't the goal at the beginning cross training and alumni so uh i'm really proud of our business leaders in our um, customer care organization they knew every single employee who used to work in these jobs that was still with the company they brought all of them back they then paired them up with new people and ran a whole training regime we had almost double i think um, just over double the amount of people uh, within a week trained up to support um, our customer care operation and that was when we thought there was going to be massive absenteeism and we haven't seen that mm -hmm. but we had we were able to spread the work out and so no one gets tired and then um, we never lost sight of our commander's intent and those three commander intent bullets those are still the priorities today those priorities have not changed they're on every call they are the thing that we track um, and any blockers to performing those so um, you got to stay aligned to the business goals. Finally, I've covered the first one. Um, our battle rhythm really was important. Um, we also adapted um, that in April. Um, seven days a week was a little long. Um, we've been able to um, reach the new normal. I've constantly kept in touch both in one-on-one -on -one meetings with executives to understand what they need, how they need it, and adjusted. So now we're at three days a week. Um, the crisis management team meets twice a week and the crisis communications team meets once a week. But each of the members of those groups is actually part of another effort called the return to the office strategy. So we're keeping everybody active, but giving them more future focused work as opposed to firefighting every day. Um, you can't have enough writers. My wife's an English major and reminds me all the time that I could be a better writer. Um, but you should get as many people um, on your team that are good writers and give them assignments. Um, raid the marketing team. Um, they're, it's filled with them. Uh, and then just make sure you take time um, to connect with your business leaders. Uh, they might t not say stuff in a group that they need to say privately, um, and you can be that trusted ear for them. They won't even tell HR stuff that they want to tell you because you're an operator and you get it. Um, but if you make that time, um, you'll, you'll really build some trust right now that you might need long term. And it's Mental Health Awareness Month. <laughs> so I just want to tell everybody out there, like, um, please take time um, for each other. Uh, our CEO, he called every VP in our organization um, within the first couple weeks to touch space. It mattered a lot, it still matters a lot, but those types of high touch events will really help you. Um, but make, t make time for yourselves uh, in this process and, and try to uh, you know keep touch with that humanity. It's gonna really get you through this. Next. Huh. 
I'm just gonna let this sit here for a minute and t let's take some questions. Um, <laughs> I I really apologize. I'm kind of a verbose person. I have a I like telling stories, but I just want to let you know that there is a new normal. Um, we're working hard on the return to office planning right now, um, but we're talking to everybody we know. Do not be shy. Call all your colleagues at other companies. They all will um, value what you know and uh, any documents you find in the process, forward them along. Um, everybody's working on the same issues. There's, don't be shy about it. I would uh, add to that too. I think um, McKinsey has put out really good thought leadership on return to the office about state local government planning, um, yeah. about taking care of your team, about what the future holds. Uh, would highly encourage you to, it's right there on their website under insights and then go to their COVID hub. Um, but they've influenced, I think, a lot of our thinking here at Bright Path, and I know it's had been influential at Athena as well. Yep. Val, uh, Andy, can we go to questions for what time we have left? Um, there haven't been any submitted, Brian. Oh. <laughs> Bridger, that's I'm because good. you covered them all. Boom. <laughs> well, then let me let me take two seconds while someone else comes up with you know their last question. But um, for look, I. Um, no one's done this and uh the partnership that you have with your suppliers and your third-party vendors and your executives and your colleagues it's going to get strengthened over um you know unfortunately over um, video teleconferencing but you got to keep um if you haven't built and it's taken me seven you know six years of working to sort of get to this um this place with an you know integrated resilient you know program that that is physical cyber and um and our platform teams all working together with the same goals uh but it started out recognizing um in, in just listening to what the different teams were working on and where their pain points were and where you can wick away work into your security team or your business continuity program or your cyber security program you might be able to be the expert that they rely on and and start building um uh, and that's how the programs will get built up into something more um, mature uh, and that's what's going to take us through this this is a, a long long um road ahead uh i don't believe for a second uh that this thing's going away this summer um i don't believe for a second that it's not coming back with a vengeance and i gotta trust that our public health experts at the states and the cdc and the, and the World Health Organization are gonna continue to give us good guidance. And you have to trust in that too. Um, uh, and, and together we're gonna get through it. But um, I really appreciate the opportunity here and Bright Path's partnership uh, hel helping uh, Athena Health. Um, and I just want everybody to stay safe out there. Val or Andy, any questions that have come in? No, uh, I did see one but... come in here actually. Oh. Um, and you might have already alluded to this, but um, this one question is, um, did any of your COVID-19 preparedness lead to employee redundancy? Um, no. Um, in fact, we've had uh, employees actually uh, who were, you know, working in one area actually take on new responsibilities. Um, so they've shown, an, uh, you know, to be adept at an entirely different line of work. Um, and so we actually are seeing some internal movement um, of engineers from one um, space to another. Um, you know, our social media um, experts actually retraining somebody else who is really interested in social media, and she's moving on to a you know, to a to a different subject um, within the company. But um, our focus is still on our roadmap, mm -hmm. our long-range plan, and serving our customers. So um, we haven't seen that at all. In fact, I mean, not only have you continued on R and D efforts on your product lines, but um, the R and D and infrastructure orgs have been moving through a significant data center transition yeah, to a new facility. And, yeah, and your uh, the leg <laughs> Bridger hinted at the beginning that uh, they had acquired some legacy GE health products. Those are also moving into Athena data centers from legacy yeah. GE data centers. That's all been happening during uh, the last month. Yeah, we migrated. We migrated a whole data center in the middle of this, <laughs> from one state to another, and uh, that was a, no small challenge. I, mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess yeah. I forgot that there one. Was, 
There, there was but, another uh, question here too. Do you see the workforce going forward working more from home? Um, I, the way in which the states are reopening and the way the public health guidance is being um, articulated is that um, employees that can work from home should continue to work from home. And Athena is looking at this in terms of a set of principles. Um, so we're building a set of principles right now, which will help us make decisions. Um, we're briefing those to the executive leadership team tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think what's important is you have to settle on your on, on how you're going to make decisions. Work from home is clearly a strategy that you need to keep in, in um, functioning and supported for the long term until we have a vaccine. They can do track and tracing of cases and testing is, a, is, a, is appropriately um, large enough so that we can get this thing below the 10 percent test positive rate that um, epidemiologists are focusing. So until then, work from home has to be part of that um, conversation. Great. Thank you both. We're at the end of our time for our participants. There will be a link out later this week that has all of the web access so you can get this information if you didn't capture it. Thank you very much to our speakers and have a great rest of the conference. Thank you. Stay safe.